Uh, my name is David Spratt. Um, I'm a baby, baby boomer activist. I've uh, done many things, but for the last 10 years I've concentrated on climate because I believe that unless we solve the climate issue, most of the other issues we care about will simply become irrelevant because climate change will overwhelm us. Um, I somewhat by accident co-wrote a book called Climate Code Red, The Case for Emergency Action, seven or eight years ago. I think the title gives away my view of, of the climate issue that we actually do now face an emergency. And I work as an activist in the inner north of Melbourne on a whole range of issues, including closing down some of the dirtiest coal-fired power stations in Australia in the La Trobe Valley. I think it's also entered the, the lexicon of policy makers and advocates, which is worse, because scientists present a wide range of information on which we make choices. And what has become very popular, particularly with the work of Bill McKibben, is to say, in order to not exceed two degrees of warming, we've got X amount of carbon budget left, which I find a really dangerous proposition. Because to say you've got a budget to people means that they'll spend it. You've got 50 bucks left in your pocket, that's your budget, you'll spend it. So saying there is more carbon emissions that we can reasonably put up, I think sends the wrong story to start with. And secondly, I think it's based on a number of false propositions. Um, the first is that when people talked about limiting warming to two degrees, and two degrees in itself is very dangerous. Um, the great NASA climate scientist James Hansen said, two degrees is a recipe for disaster, based on what we've seen two degrees in the past uh, producing, and I think that's correct. But two degrees was originally conceived of as an upper limit, something that you would not pass. And now the language has changed into being a target. And if you think of an arrow and a target, you might hit the target, you might miss and missing the target is now part of the discussion. So people will say, well, we have a carbon budget for two degrees with a 66% chance of not getting past two degrees, which means there's a big chance of overcoming it. So the carbon budget figure for two degrees actually could produce between one and three degrees of warming. So these are risks. We would never let children near a pool uh, or drive a car or get in the lift or build a bridge if there's a one in three chance of failure. But that sort of failure is now built into the carbon budget discussion. If, for example, you want to be really sure of not exceeding two degrees, as, which I've said I think is too high a target, if you want to be 95% sure of not exceeding two degrees, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere should be 350 parts per million, and we're now at 400. So from all those points of view, if you want to be risk averse, or what business people would call adopt sensible risk management practices, you would say there's too much CO2 up there already, so the proposition that you, that you might reasonably put more up there seems to me absurd. Well, in order to build new infrastructure at the moment, we have to use fossil fuels. I think there is, there is a radical change happening in society in that a, an amazing energy revolution is happening. If you look at Germany, there's 900 or 1,000 non-corporate renewable energy projects uh, around the country. And they have changed the market such that, as I understand, the six largest electricity companies in Germany at present have a zero net share market value. And we've seen the same thing with the coal uh, industry in Australia, where prospective mines simply will not be built because the coal price is half of what it used to be. So all industrial revolutions are based on creative destruction of old industries, and that creative destruction is going on. I think the issue is that it's not going on fast enough. And the point that Professor Kevin Anderson from the Tyndall Centre in the UK makes all the time is that you actually can't build new electricity supply fast enough to deal with the existing demand. So one of the primary structures, uh, strategies is to reduce electricity demand. It, the, the demand you reduce means there's less new infrastructure needs to be built. And I think that's in some ways been an underestimated um, aspect of the transition radical emissions demand reduction. Look, we have a, a, a circumstance in Australia now, if you're building a house, um, particularly as it's expected that, that battery storage costs will probably be down by a third in two or three years, 
that it is now cheaper for you to put panels on the roof and put in battery storage than connect to the grid and pay those prices over the next 20 years. So renewables and storage are now um, cheaper than building new coal-fired power stations. The problem is we have a whole lot of existing old coal-fired power stations whose capital has been paid for long ago, they've been depreciated off and their cost of production is, is low. So we have the, the contradiction that new renewables are cheaper than new coal, but they're not cheaper than old coal. So we do obviously need some mechanism to adequately price uh, the cost of old coal. I mean, for example, in the Latrobe Valley, we have the third dirtiest power station in the world, Hazelwood. Uh, some research done at, at Harvard suggests that the real social costs of that power station, which is the carbon pollution plus the immediate health costs, is around $900 million a year. And this is a place that turns over $300 million. If you cost, if you, if you price the real cost of those stations, none of them would be in the market. But you can also close them down through emission uh, emissions standards or similar. So that's, we're in this transition where renewables are cheaper than new coal, but not as cheap as old coal. So not only do we not price the real cost of fossil fuels, that is what economists would call the externalities, the cost that are not borne by the market, uh, pollution, health effects, CO2 in the atmosphere, but they actually receive a large subsidy in Australia by numbers of ways. There are, for example, diesel concessions for the mining industry uh, and for primary production. There are all sorts of hidden subsidies, accelerated depreciation. Uh, those costs are thought to be up to $10 billion a year in Australia alone. So these are hidden subsidies to keep on burning planet-destroying greenhouse gases. I think if we looked back at Australia a few years ago, there was a cargo cult around coal. Um, uh, there was some work done which suggested that if every new coal mine that was being suggested five, seven years ago could be built in Australia, and they were all built, Australia's carbon exports would be greater than those of Saudi Arabia, to give you a sense of the scale of where we were going. Obviously, things have changed since then. Uh, China is becoming less carbon intensive. A lot of its steel production and carbon dependency is starting to go. They're saying to close down some of their old coal-fired power stations. So we've seen a radical disjunction in, in the coal industry. A lot of those new mines are, are now not going to be built. Some existing mines are being closed. And um, the price of coal has effectively dropped by half since we were going to be the biggest carbon source in the world. So there is radical destruction in that fossil fuel market at the moment. And the carbon bubble idea was the idea that a huge amount of new investment would be put into oil and gas and coal, and then in fact would be stranded. And one of the reasons it's going to be stranded is obviously there's this revolution in clean energy. I mean, who 10 years ago would think you could put a, a battery on the side of your house and store 10 kilowatts of power? I mean, this was an absurd proposition. So the carbon budget, uh, it's like people who built, would have built a million horse and buggies, buggies for horses in the year 1900, not thinking the car was around the corner. It's, it's that sort of the market not being sensitive to, to a new industrial revolution, which is what we've got with energy at the moment. Obviously the fossil fuel industry has to close down and has to close down really quickly. There are two ways that's going to happen. One, the new industrial energy revolution is slowly going to undermine the profits. So we've seen, for example, in Australia, people talking about a death spiral for the existing uh, electricity retailers because people are finding it cheaper to put panels on their roof and they're losing their market. I mean, that's one of the reasons why demand for electricity in Victoria and, and New South Wales is dropping energy efficiency, plus people putting uh, panels on their houses, but it's also important to withdraw the social licence for fossil fuel, the idea that it is reasonable for these companies to keep on behaving the way they have, and there are various aspects of that. One is obviously to campaign for their closure directly, 
as we do with dirty power stations. Another is to campaign for new facilities not to be open, whether it be in Queensland or on the, on the Liverpool Plains. And another one is to say through the financial system, and it's partly a political act as, as much as a financial act, we do not support these industries and we want this to be a public story. This is a moral question about not investing in these, the, these industries. And that's where I think divestment comes in because it's something that everybody can do. Everybody's got a bank account or a super fund. It's not something that some activists do somewhere else. We can all do it and I think that's been the power of the movement. Ab absolutely. I mean, we, if you look at the uh, trajectory of share prices for the coal industry in America, some of the worst investments you could have put your superannuation into at the moment is the coal industry. They've been, uh, their prices have been just dropping. The, the, in many parts of the world, the business model for fossil fuels is really starting to falter and it's reflected in share price. So they become bad investments, people get out. Um, if enough people get out, their, their price of uh, borrowing capital increases and it becomes, it really does become a death spiral. I mean, Bill McKibben said that in the first instance, um, divestment was a political statement rather than an economic strategy and I think we have to remember that that's also the case. Um, Anderson Bauer said it required a deep growth strategy and then they went back a bit and said maybe so I think they sat on the fence of that. I think their first point was that you obviously have to decouple uh, fossil fuel use from economic activity. Whether that's possible in a growth economy is a question that people debate. It's not an area of expertise for me and I won't go into it because others know that issue better than I do. The, mo the more important point they made is that it actually is quite expensive to build new energy infrastructure. It's not something you click your finger and it's there. There are trillions and trillions of dollars in the world um, tied up in old energy infrastructure and it costs a lot to build new stuff. I mean one of the beauties about uh, PV on household roofs is households do it themselves out of economic self-interest. But they said if you really want to reduce emissions quickly and in the next 10 years, and that's obviously really key, it's much quicker, easier and cheaper to do it by reducing demand than it is by building all this new infrastructure. Uh, they ran a conference on it uh, called the Radical Emissions Reduction Conference which I think really covered the issue well um, and it's really true. Every time you reduce emissions there's a whole new piece of infrastructure, sorry, every time you reduce energy use there's a whole lot of infrastructure and materials and energy for it that don't have to be used. When I first came to this issue, it was when Sir Nicholas Stern brought out his famous report for the UK government, I think in 2005, and he said, look, here's all the science, and the science says we should keep atmospheric carbon dioxide to 450 parts per million, which is two degrees. Well, it might be three, it might be, it wasn't a great proposition. And then he went on to say, but, Rather than going for 450, I think we should go for 550, which on an average is three degrees of warming, because 450 would be too economically disruptive. And when Ross Garno did his first report for the Australian government, he had some similar propositions in his first report. And these, to me, were clear statements of, let's get the economics first, by which we mean we don't want anything which is economically disruptive to the free market economy and then the science comes second. Rather than saying what scientifically we, do we need to do to keep this place safe and what economic measures would be necessary which would obviously be somewhat disruptive and so I think economics has always led the public international climate policy making debate rather than scientific imperative.
I think Naomi, Naomi Klein has said many things. She said it's incompatible with capitalism, it's incompatible with free market or neoliberal capitalism. Uh, at other times she said, well, if we had a carbon price and some energy efficiency, maybe we will solve the problem, which is a much more reformist position. So it's not being clear to me what Naomi Klein's position is. Um, I think of this about, about this by just asking some fundamental questions and I like to think about air travel because it's something we're all addicted to, we all love it, it's a great marketing tool, uh, one in three Australians travel overseas every year and there's a notion out there that all these planes can keep on going, it's the fastest growing sector of emissions in the world, air travel, that somehow will produce billions and billions of gallons of biofuels and this industry will keep on going. Now my understanding is that we simply can't produce that amount of biofuels because we start to eat into crop production and other necessary things and if you were going to produce huge amounts of biofuels then perhaps they would be for tractors and agriculture and basic and moving food about rather than going to somebody's wedding in Fiji. And I just think that air travel really poses a question about what sustainability means. I mean every night um, jumbo jet loads of flowers take off from the lakesides in Kenya to send product to the London flower market the next morning. Literally jumbo jets loads. Is this what sustainability looks like? T to me it doesn't and I think if we think about air travel we can think about the sort of actually quite radical changes we need. I don't think that mass air travel as I see the technological options, is compatible with a climate that we can live in, as one example. I mean, it's, it's very clear that neoliberal capitalism is incompatible with solving the climate problem. Um, what is compatible is a debate that's not resolved. So the Paris conference follows Copenhagen in 2009 which was a complete disaster because there was supposed to be a binding agreement and nothing happened and it actually cost Kevin Rudd his prime ministership in the end because he came back to Australia and backflipped and decided not to do anything and uh, that was the end for him. Um, so they have a new approach for Paris which is rather than trying to get everybody to sign up to a binding deal, instead countries voluntarily put on the table what they will think they will do in the next period. So it's a voluntary process. And the consequence of that, if, if you look at all those promises so far, is that global warming would then be on a trajectory towards three degrees of warming, which is still an absolute disaster. So uh, the, the optimists would say that it's bent the curve down I would say it has bent the curve not nearly enough. Um, and if you, if, if all that's done the next 15 years are the promises that have now been made for Paris, and it's a problematic question whether those promises will be fully implemented because there's no binding deal with panelists for not doing so. If those promises were fully implemented, global greenhouse emissions in 2030 would be higher than they are today. And I don't think that's a good outcome because it's essentially a three degree path and three degrees is getting pr pretty close to being incompatible with the maintenance of human civilization. If we look at past climates, three degrees of warming is t looking in the long term at sea level rises in the tens of metres past climates at the current level of greenhouse gases have been three to six degrees warmer than pre-industrial and sea levels have been 25 to 40 metres higher than today. That takes a long time to work through the system but given that human civilization is based on coastal cities and our richest agricultural lands are river deltas, um, this is a transformation that I can't see that in any way would be compatible with human society as we see it today. So don't, so don't buy land too close to the sea level when you build your sustainability <laughs> village. One of the things I think that's happened is that climate change has become a whole lot of abstract numbers.
So we'll have a 66% chance of this or a 30% chance of this. And we'll have so many parts per million in the atmosphere and it becomes very mathematical and abstract rather than human centred. And there have been discussions and there are charts saying, well, if we do this, we'll get two degrees of warming. And it's obvious now that climate change is, is dangerous at one degree. At one degree, we are losing the Arctic sea ice, the economic, the, sorry, the Arctic ecosystem is being destroyed beyond recognition. At one degree, we've now got evidence that some Antarctic gla glaciers are past their um, tipping points. Uh, this year, uh, with these really hot El Nino driven uh, conditions, there's perhaps the greatest bleaching of coral reefs in the recent period going on. It's clear it's dangerous now and they say well if we do this we'll have a X percentage of maybe I think four degrees and classically when John Howard was Prime Minister one night on late line somebody asked him so what do you think four degrees would be like for your grandchildren Mr Howard, the Prime Minister? And he responded well I guess it'd be a bit less comfortable for some. But we know that four degrees is enough to melt all the ice on the planet. Four degrees is enough to produce a 70 metre sea level rise. So Kevin Anderson, Professor Kevin Anderson, uh, a couple of years ago wrote a piece in which he said, I and the scientists I talk with, we all feel and believe that four degree rise is incompatible with the maintenance of human civilization, which is clearly true. And at the same time, he and and uh, John Schellenhuber, who's head of the Potsdam Institute in Germany, advisor to the EU, advisor to Angela Merkel um, at the press conference for the release of the papal encyclical. I mean, a very well-connected man. Both of them said, if we get to four degrees, we think the human population on the planet is going to be under a billion people. And that is a fairly arresting proposition. Um, and more recently they've been loath to say that again because I think it's a, it's a proposition that um, we as a society and policy makers actually can't deal with, though I believe it to be true. I would say we now face an existential crisis that may bring human civilization to an end. This is, where I, that, this is what I think we're facing given the uh, current emissions trajectory. This needs a whole of society effort to try and resolve it. This, re this requires the same level of effort as society put in trying to go to the moon. I mean, that famous speech where Kennedy said, we don't do this because it's easy, but because it's difficult and the impossible was achieved in 10 years. I don't think climate change is as easy as getting to the moon, but a huge effort. Um, after the Second World War, the Marshall Plan, where considerable proportion of available resources were built into, put into rebuilding Europe. People often talk about the war economy, the Second World War, where we know the major parties spent between 30 and 60 percent of their economy trying to win a war. Not a good aim, but it just shows that when society really wants to solve a problem, it can do it. And I think that's the sort of approach we have to take. We have to solve this problem and we've got to spend whatever it takes to get there. And we termed, used the, the, the term emergency because if you think about a bushfire or a flood, you actually say, this is an emergency, this is a crisis, we've got to put whatever resources we need to to solve this. Whatever firefighters we have to put in to, to stop this fire in the Hazelwood mine, and it was $30 million worth of firefighters, that's what we will do. We have to rescue these people. If it's the Air Force, if it's every helicopter in Australia, we'll put them in there. So we have an attitude towards short-term emergencies that we don't have towards the greatest emergency this society has ever faced. I think where well, you obviously um, in the very first instance need an overall plan because this cannot be resolved by the market. If you look at any form of crisis, emergency, going to the moon, fighting a war, a Marshall Plan, responding to Fukushima, the state intervenes in really large scale and plans the transition.
Um, so that's the first proposition. You need to develop a whole of society plan to deal with that. You also need to really quickly bolster the sort of research and development that will bring the, the energy revolution forward in time. I mean, it is amazing the efficiency of solar cells. I mean, solar cells that, you know, were $100 are going to be 25 cents in, in five years' time. Uh, we need to bring that, that change forward because we've got a lot of energy system to, to replace as quickly as possible. Um, the very short things, uh, the short term things you would do, I think, well, once you've got that plan, is understand that you're going to be closing a whole lot of fossil fuels as fast as you practically can. You need transition, social and job transition plans for it. Um, if you look at uh, even war planning or a Marshall Plan, it's not just about investment, it's about jobs, it's about where the capital is coming from, uh, it's about the social dislocation. I think you actually have to plan for those things as well. If we're not going to have a mass tourism industry, what's going to happen? It will be an internal tourism industry. Maybe we'll have holidays in Australia rather than around the world. I mean, these are all doable, but it means thinking in a different way and thinking holistically. I think the fastest way to reduce fossil fuel use is administratively. And by that I mean you take out the subsidies, you impose emission standards. You simply say if your piece of infrastructure does not meet this standard, it will be closed down. That's the approach that Obama has taken in the US. The trouble with carbon prices and carbon markets um, is a lot of people can make a lot of money out of them without emissions being reduced very much. They just become another form of speculation and that's what worries me about them. If it's well constructed it can, if there isn't any international trading, if there isn't any of the sorts of deals that we've seen in the past where money's been put into uh, uh, Ponzi schemes for emissions reductions which really didn't happen. Yes, a, a strictly applied carbon price can work. I'm not quite sure in a neoliberal economic and political environment that such a desirable outcome would be achieved. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a baby boomer and a child of the 60s, uh, so I have a cultural predisposition towards some old-fashioned notions were around in that time. Um, small is beautiful and simpler is good and um, I guess this becomes a moral question in part. There's a lot of work which suggests around the world that happiness or well-being ceases to be connected to income once it gets above about $10,000 US per head. So research shows in countries where, and we are at thirty or forty thousand dollars per head that we are not in fact improving our well-being we're actually becoming more miserable this is a society where the greatest predicted epidemic of the 21st century is depression and mental health issues so we've obviously lost the connection between a reasonable level of income and and personal well-being and so I think we actually need a much simpler life in many ways than we do now. We are a society where identity is constructed through consumption. I shop, therefore I am, was the, the greatest <laughs> maxim of, the, of, of recent decades and it's true. Um, and there is a fetish about having more and having the latest and oh your iPhone's only a five, mine's a six, how can you look at yourself in the morning? This sort of thing, um, that is obviously not socially or personally healthy and I think a rapid decarbonisation would help to realise um, uh, that disconnection between income and consumption and, and well-being. I certainly don't think that we will travel and move as fast or as far as we have now because I think those forms of transport and movement are simply unsustainable, as one example. We face a complex problem because associated with burning a lot of fossil fuels we're also producing a lot of things which are called aerosols. Um, the best 
example of an aerosol is all that stuff that's thrown up from a volcano. A lot of dust but also a lot of sulphates which are very short term in the atmosphere. And sulphates have a very short term cooling effect of about a week. So as we pour up this carbon dioxide we're also throwing up these sulphates which are helping to mask the warming that the carbon dioxide is, is called. Uh, the NASA scientist James Hansen called it our Faustian bargain, our bargain with the devil. And as soon as we start reducing those uh, carbon dioxide emissions, we're also going to lose these uh, cooling sulphates. And there's perhaps a degree of cooling sulphates in the air because we are burning fossil fuels. This is not well understood. And so this is a real dilemma. And one of the ways to overcome that dilemma is to try and quickly reduce our methane production. Methane is the second uh, most significant greenhouse gas. Uh, carbon dioxide lasts effectively for thousand year, thousands of years. Methane is out of the atmosphere in 10 years on average. So being able to really quickly produce, reduce methane consumptions will help us deal with this Faustian bargain. And obviously, um, uh, animal use and consumption is a significant part of methane, not the only one. It's also significantly coming from rice production, for which there may be genetically engineered solutions, which is another perhaps Faustian bargain, and from uh, degradation of wastelands and swamplands. But obviously uh, getting methane emissions down from the um, animal husbandry sector is, is really important. I think in almost all political issues th there are three levels of things to do. Um, one is in your own life. There's no reason not to put panels on your roof uh, to draw zero coal-fired power from the grid. That's now not just a moral question, it's an economically sensible question. Um, it's also important to work with local community. Uh, with family. I mean, it's odd that climate change has become like sex, religion and politics, one of the, the four things that you can't talk about at the Christmas table. And there's a lot of people find the conversation about climate difficult. People lose friends over it. There are brawls at Christmas, literally over it. Uh, so it's important that we start that conversation because unless we can talk about it, we can't solve it. So while it seems trivial, I think that's really important. We've seen the power of community. We've seen community owned uh, wind farms, renewable energy farms. We've seen in Germany how the mass take up of community not for profit, renewable energy at a local level has helped to destroy the business model of the old electricity sector. So that community sector should never be underestimated. But in the end, power in this society is wielded on behalf of corporations by national governments and state governments and we also need to be active at that level because we can do all sorts of sustainable things in our own lives and if the Tony Abbott's and the climate deniers of and similar or the people who are not going to do enough and that's the existing large parties in Australia remain in power that becomes an insuperable obstacle because this requires a whole of society plan and that requires a government that also has a whole of society plan and intention. Obviously, I think there's now a disconnection between levels of income and personal well-being. The, the fact that depression and mental health issues are now the greatest, one of the greatest issues, epidemics in 21st century advanced capitalist countries makes that obviously the case. Um, the 1960s had a phrase that small was beautiful and less is more and maybe that is about to be realised. It's just taken a long time to get there. You can't produce an answer unless you name the problem accurately. And the same is true of climate science. Unless we really understand the circumstances we're in, we're not going to get the solutions and find the path to it. And I've seen what I called after Barbara Ehrenreich a lot of bright siding. Uh, it's all happy clappy, it's all good, we're all going in the right direction, there's renewable energy, sunflowers, all of this. I think in part some of that 
is a personal psychological response of people wanting to talk about the good news because it allows them to go on. Um, but we have to deal with this problem as it really is. And it is arresting and it is difficult. Um, climate scientists say to me, if you want to find a really honest, depressing conversation, go into a, into a lab of climate scientists for morning tea because the informal chat will be far more arresting than the public presentation of it. Um, I think we have to say we don't know whether we are going to get out of this. Um, the wars are very bad analogies, but when you start a war, you don't know whether you're going to win or lose. And it is not clear that we are going to resolve this. It is also very clear that we have the capacity and the knowledge to resolve it. And that, this is emotionally very difficult. And I have come and gone through these issues a couple of times, but Kevin Anderson gave a presentation which I thought was really aptly, aptly named. I might have one word wrong, but I think it was called uh, Brutal Reality, Tenuous Hope. And I think he was reflecting an emotional state and a state of the science, which is true. This is really brutal. We do have hope, but it's going to be very difficult. And to pretend otherwise, to pretend it's going to be light and easy, that it's going to be business as usual, that everybody keep on making profit, we don't have to change much, to, to think like that actually means that we can't get to the solution we need. We need brutal reality in order to solve the problem.